So yesterday, just a reminder, we finished the conversation on the point where we discussed various capsids. We figured out that they're helical capsids, and icosahedral and complex capsids, but it's all it's all very interesting. It's it's called structural virology. But of course, the pressing point is how viruses of different sorts replicate in the cells, whether those are eukaryotic cells or prokaryotic cells. And we're going to start the conversation about this with um, bacteriophage. Now, I want to give you a little note here. You may hear some people saying bacteriophage in singular, bacteriophages in plural. Uh, technically speaking, the rule of science, scientific language, bacteriophage is both singular and plural. Of course, people don't follow that rule. I'm the example, I sometimes say bacteriophages. So don't worry about that. So these are the viruses that infect bacteria and archaea. Essentially, the um, viruses of prokaryotic cells. Very important thing that I want to tell you about those guys. Um, we do not know of any bacteriophage that can infect eukaryotic cells. Let this thought th sink in. Okay? So the virus infects bacterial cells or archaeal cells but it cannot infect cells of eukaryotes. Okay? Second, some phages can infect different bacterial species. That's what the capacity of the phage, and speaking broadly of the virus, to infect a particular cell. What determines if the virus can infect a cell? Presence of receptor on the surface of the cell. Very good. Presence of receptor. So if you have several bacterial species that have the receptor for the phage, these species are going to be infected. Okay? As other viruses, bacteriophages may have RNA or DNA genomes. However, they have a unique feature uh, that uh, distinguishes them from the eukaryotic viruses. The capsid of bacteriophage does not enter the bacterial or archaeal cell. So they work as tiny syringes. They inject the DNA or RNA genome into the cell. Does that make sense? Okay. Capsid doesn't enter the cell, only, only the genome. And bacteriophages can replicate by two different cycles. One cycle is called a lytic cycle. It is exemplified on this scheme. When genome enters the cell, bacterial cell, it is being, well, if it's DNA genome, it is transcribed and then resulting mRNA is translated. If it's the RNA genome, whatever, it's positive or negative, eventually proteins are synthesized as well. The idea is that at the certain stage, stage of biosynthesis, okay, phage proteins are produced and phage proteins start to replicate phage genome. So you have more you see these little blue worms? Those are tiny genomes of the phage and a bunch of proteins. Uh, all of them, the genomes and the proteins, they start to assemble into the particles, the phage particles. So cell, bacterial cell, becomes full of phage particles. And then eventually, these phage particles leave the cell. What's going to happen to a bacterial cell when hundreds, and I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of phages live it? 
It's going to explode, yeah. There are, again, due to the, not going too deep into the idea, but some corporate thoughts, I'm not showing you this particular photograph, but there are electron microscopy photographs which show pretty much disassembling bacterial cell, okay? And a bunch of phages that just leave it, those tiny, tiny alien spaceships. Phages are the great, were the great tool to study viruses. Um, they, and one of the good reasons, think about this, they grow on bacterial cells, which are very easy to cultivate. They are cheap. You don't need sophisticated equipment to maintain them. Phages, phage, phage, do not infect humans, so they're safe, okay? You need to be more concerned about bacteria rather than about the phage. So they're really easy to study. And trust me, the, the dawn of the molecular biology was based on studies of bacteria and phage because they're so easy to manipulate. Phage, lytic phage. Can it be a new wonderful tool for the microbial control? Don't be afraid to say something. What do you think? Yes, it has a potential, sure. Unfortunately, well, it's not so much unfortunately, however, I would say, there is no approved phage therapy in the United States. The leading institution that studies phage as the antimicrobial therapy method is located in Tbilisi, Georgia. Obviously not the states, the state of Georgia, it's the country of Georgia. Um, and what they mostly use phage for is to treat uh, complicated wound infections. Treating, you know, systemic disease or um, gut problems seems, seems much harder. What are the challenges? What are the challenges? What are the problems that can be associated or associated with a potential phage therapy? Exactly, specificity. Even if you know that a particular phage that you target for the therapy infects and destroys whatever pathogenic bacteria you want, you don't know if this phage is going to target something else. It's, it's, it's conceptually impossible. Does that make sense? Okay, specificity is one problem. What is another problem? Uh, so phages can phage can mutate absolutely, and they replicate really fast. You can imagine that those mutations can lead to them changing specificity, uh, becoming non-pathogenic. Okay. Contr yeah, so you cannot really control, I mean, you let it out in the open and they they there. You cannot control their spread. You're absolutely right. You're a bacteria. You are bacteria. Fast replicating bacteria. And humans, the almighty, Unleash the power of phage on your head. Are you going to just sit there and die? What are you going to do? You're fast replicating bacteria. What else is going to happen to you, to your genome? Yeah, you're going to develop resistance somehow, right? You're going to develop some sort of resistance to the, to the phage. Does that make sense? No, that's problem number, I don't know which one, 
Okay. So far we got specificity, lack of control, uh, resistance. What else did I forget? Uh, mutations, yes, yeah, so or change in the phage. All of that, and last but not least, think about this. When we have a drug, say Viagra, it's, a, it's a, one of the best examples of pharmaceutical industry. Well, I should say sildenafil citrate because I think the patent for Viagra is expired now, so pretty much everybody can make it. So you have sildenafil citrate. You buy this from Pfizer or you buy this from some third-party small manufacturing company. If both pills are FDA approved, what's going to be in those pills? Whether you buy it from Pfizer or from Dr. K Incorporated. There you go. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you care about active ingredient, right? So if those are FDA approved, you know that FDA controls the amount of the stuff in the pills and that it's exactly this stuff. So like you're buying ibuprofen. I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's, I don't know, CVS or some other company, right? Or Walgreens or whatever. It's going to be ibuprofen. You can expect when you pop that pill, it's going to help you with the pain. With phage, it's not homogenous prep. You don't really know what's in there. You just possibly cannot know. Does that make sense? And I remembered what I wanted to. The last problem, not the last. What phage? What are they made of? Which molecules? Nucleic acids and proteins. In relation to human immune system, nucleic acids and proteins are what? Go ahead. Antigens. So what what does human immune system do <laughs> with antigens? It develops what? Immune response. So you, you you put the phage, I don't know, you inject the phage, do something like that one time. Your immune system recognizes it. Second time you apply it, there's going to be immune response. You're not going to feel it. It's not going to be like you're going to get sick, but phage is going to get killed right away by your own immune system. Does that make sense? That's a problem with any protein-based or nucleic acid-based therapy. Second, third, fourth time, if your immune system recognizes it as an antigen, it's going to be less and less and less effective. Does that make sense? Let's summarize what we've learned about this. So what are the problems? Remind me if I forget something. Specificity. What else? Phage mutation, right? Okay. Control. Resistance. Very good. And host immunity. No wonder FDA does not want to take that much responsibility. But um, there was a there was a, an article I, I read it you know, seven years ago, something like ages ago. I think it was in Time about that institution in Georgia, and actually there are American patients. They travel there and they get treatment there. It's mostly wound infections. And with wounds, it works wonders. But it's essentially personalized therapy. So when you come in, it's not like you're coming in, they put a, a patch and you're cured. They're going to take a sample, they're going to culture, they're going to determine what the bacteria is, they have a library of phage, they're going to select the one that works the best, try it if it may be a mixture of phages. So it's, 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 it's pretty complicated. But that's the type of medicine that at least developed countries slowly move towards personalized medicine. We now have capacity to tailor it to the, uh, the person's needs. Now, lysogenic cycle, slightly different. You have heard this word before. 
So in lysogenic cycle, the initial infection doesn't kill the bacteria. Instead, phage DNA is inserted into the genome of bacteria. So during the first stage, okay, first step of, of infection, the DNA of the phage is inserted into the bacterial cell. Everything happens as usual. But then instead of being transcribed and then translated and producing proteins, DNA of the phage incorporates itself into the DNA of the bacterial cell. This happens through the process of recombination. Okay. Um, not for the exam, but to give you an idea what happens when um, bacterial DNA is copied. DNA polymerase can accidentally jump from the bacterial DNA on the phage DNA and then jump back. So it's it kind of, you know, you copy the book, somebody sticks another page in there, and you just automatically copy that page as well. So you have like an additional page in the book. Does that make sense? So this in this copy of the phage DNA is called a prophage. What it does, it does nothing. It just sits there for a while. Okay. Then, usually due to the environmental stress, the cellular signaling in the cell, in the phage, oh sorry, in the bacterial cell, it stimulates the prophage to cut itself out. And then, when prophage is excised back, this DNA starts to, be, it, it gets replicated, it gets transcribed, translated, and you've got phage particles, and they leave the cell, they lyse it, and the cell goes, the cell dies. So essentially, lysogenic um, cycle, the name lysogenic means that it can generate lysis, but later. Does that make sense? The great thing for the phage, from the standpoint of replication, it's a perfect way to spread through the population of bacterial cells. Because once the prophage is in the genome, it's going to get replicated with the genome. Every new bacterial cell is going to have a prophage. So it's pretty much getting spread effortlessly. Some prophage become dysfunctional over the time. Mutations during the bacterial replication may shift them, may, may kind of flick a switch, okay? So they they cannot excise themselves anymore. Does that make sense? So it's just, it's just stuck there forever. And it turns out the phage, the prophage, can carry some beneficial traits for the bacteria. I don't know, it may be a drug resistance gene, it may be a virulence factor. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. We talked about two primary pathogens, Clostri uh, Clostridium, Quirinibacterium diphtheria, the causative agent of diphtheria, and Vibrio cholerae. Quirinibacterium diphtheria encodes a toxin that kills cells. Remember, it inhibits the translation. Vibrio cholerae encodes a toxin that stimulates cyclic AMP production, which in turn stimulates cellular secretion. That's what, that's what creates diarrhea. Both of those toxins are encoded by phage. Some hundred thousand million years ago, that phage incorporated itself into the genome, got stuck in there. And that's where the toxin comes from. You can cut out that phage molecule. It was done. You can cut out the, you can kind of figure out what is the phage, cut it out, the entire thing, stitch back the ends of bacterial chromosome. Bacteria will replicate perfectly fine. 
just perfectly fine without that phage, but will be non-pathogenic. Does that make sense? Phage that replicate via lysogenic cycle are often called temperate phage. Take home message. You have to be able to recognize the description of lytic lysogenic cycle, okay, and steps of each cycle, right? The order. You'll have to understand what the prophage is, the pitfalls and the problems with the phage therapy, uh, and with the lysogenic cycle, just the idea of prophage being able to, to carry beneficial traits. Is that clear? Okay. We're moving closer and closer to bad bugs. This is the general overview, and I want to highlight. It's the overview. It's not an ultimate rule. It's not like this for all the viruses, but it's a, the example of the, the mammalian virus replication cycle, or eukaryotic virus replication cycle. Generally, replication cycles are very different for RNA viruses versus DNA viruses, double-stranded RNA versus single-stranded RNA. They, they hugely different. We can dig into that to give you a perspective to go over briefly to briefly go over the replication cycles of viruses with different types of genomes takes about an hour and a half, briefly. So we're not going to do that. I want to focus more on the clinical aspects rather than the fundamental aspects. However, every virus goes through certain common steps of the replication. First and foremost, Viruses interact with the receptor in the surface. That's the mandatory. So cells that can be infected, cells with the receptor, are called susceptible. Okay. For instance, um, influenza virus infects epithelial cells of the upper respiratory tract because they have a receptor. So cells of the upper respiratory tract are susceptible. Does that make sense? So that will determine which tissues are infected and which host can be infected. To give you a perspective on this, mice, just regular mice, do not have receptor for poliovirus. They do not have receptor for hepatitis C virus. You cannot infect mice with either polio or hepatitis C. Does that make sense? Receptor for hepatitis C is on the hepatocytes. You cannot infect fibroblasts with hepatitis C. There is no receptor. Okay, so it defines host and tissue tropism. On the other hand, West Nile virus infects practically everything. Humans, birds, fish, like all mammals. Well, I don't know if they tried platypus, but pretty much you take a dog, you can infect the dog. Mouse, rat, hamster, cat. Lion, I don't know, I don't think they ever try to infect lion with West Nile, but it's possible. It will infect practically every cell starting from fibroblast and ending with a neuron. This is called promiscuous virus, okay? So, you see that it, it, it all differs. Viruses can be extremely specific and extremely narrow in terms of the tropism, or they can infect anything. And that is all defined by the receptor. Clear? Once the virus is bound to the receptor, it penetrates into the cell. This scheme very elegantly avoids the issue of penetration. 
because penetration can happen through multitude of ways. Okay? Now, let's recall the transport of things in the cell. When something binds to the receptor, something big, what cell, eukaryotic cell, usually does with that something big? How does it take it in? Forms a vesicle. Endocytosis. Endocytosis is very common in the virus infection, but it's not the only way. Some viruses pretty much make a pore in the membrane and just in, like, like, like phage, inject the nucleic acid in the cell. Others, they fuse their envelope, phospholipid containing envelope with a membrane and just cops it enters the cell. There are plenty of ways, okay? But essentially penetration is the way to take virus into the cell, right? And we're not going to focus on how the virus gets in there, but eventually what happens, virus, virus particle, will get disassembled in the cytoplasm. It can be done directly in a cytoplasm, or it can happen in the so-called the endosome. Endosome becomes acidic, and the change in the pH pretty much disassembles the capsid. The point is that step when virus capsid gets dismantled is called uncoding. The result of this step is viral nucleic acid, those little tiny blue worms, in the cytoplasm. Now this example is using influenza virus. And influenza virus is rather unusual. Influenza virus has RNA genome, which enters the nucleus of infected cell gets copied in the nucleus, making double-stranded RNA. And then these double-stranded RNAs are used for transcription, produce mRNA, and then it goes translation, and so on and so forth. Okay? So that step, when viral RNA is used for synthesis of virus proteins and synthesis of new genomes, is called biosynthesis. And eventually, number of viral genomic RNA, they get assembled with the proteins, newly synthesized virus proteins, that's called assembly, and then virus is released from the cell. So I have six steps. Attachment, penetration, uncoding, biosynthesis, assembly, and release. Okay? Sort of take-home message understand what's going on during each step. It is fairly simple, like one sentence. Does that make sense? So far? Am I clear? Do you have any questions about this? So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you a description of a step and you will have to pick which word is correct for it. Okay? Cool. So this is for you sort of a, a, a word word based description of what you saw in the previous slide I am not gonna go over steps so we're gonna pretty much so this we, we discussed we discussed uh, through this we're gonna talk about some differences in a little bit but I want to show you the idea of the viral growth curve the viral growth curve is slightly different from bacterial. Can viruses die? No, it's... Can they die? No. Well, they can. Non-living cannot die. Does that make sense? They just... They're not living. They can't possibly die. So, growth curve has four stages. First is the stage of inoculation. So if, um, what do you need to grow the virus? Cells. 
You need the cells. First of all, first and foremost, you need the cells. Now we can grow cells outside of the organism. We can, and that's actually pretty, well, it's not very, very simple, but it can be done. You take an organ, say, a kidney, mush it up, add some trypsin, which is the protease, that separates cells one from another. You watch this suspension, okay? And then you filter the big chunks, pretty much. You collect the suspension with what you hope are individual cells and put it on the plastic surface. And you wait. Some of those cells are going to stick to the surface. So you wait till they stick, it's about overnight. You wash everything else away. You add medium that allows cells to grow and you see them dividing and growing and filling up the space. So essentially you prepare the culture of primary kidney cells. Does that make sense? It's pretty simple. Before that, before Renato del Becco developed that technique, the cell culture technique, we had to use animals, which as you can imagine is a pain in the ass. So you have to use like a ton of mice to cultivate virus. Okay, and if mice cannot support, then you have to switch like hamsters or cats or dogs or monkeys. You know, really, pigs. A big problem. So, when you inoculate the cells, when you have cells, you add virus. What does virus do first? Think about the replication curve, the replication process. It sticks into the cell. And what happens to it next? It's, it's in the viruses on the cell. What does the virus do next? Get into the cell. Awesome. Let's stop at this for a second. This curve shows you the number of virus particles outside of the cell. Does that make sense? So when you add virus to the cells and virus penetrates, obviously the number of virus particles outside is going to decrease. Reasonable, right? They kind of hide into the cell. And then, during the eclipse stage, pretty much all particles are in the cells. So you don't see anything outside. Once the virus starts to reproduce and, and it starts to get released from the cells, you see the increase of the virus particles outside of the cell. Does that make sense? They leave the cell and there are more and more of particles outside of the cell culture. That makes sense? It's like alien. Think about this. Like you have an, one alien gets into the astronaut. And for some time you don't see any aliens. And then they just start to pop out. Okay? So you see much more aliens. That's, that's what essentially happens. However, at a certain point, that increase stops. And you see the plateau. What do you think is the reason for that? Yes, good. What happens to the cells when virus replicates? Eventually, they die, yeah. So when they run out of cells, they, they cannot get accumulated anymore. Does that make sense? Now, going back to this, there are two types of viruses, naked and enveloped. Naked viruses that do not have that outer phospholipid coverage, when they pop out of the cell, they kill the cell, they lyse it. Enveloped viruses, I don't, it's, it's really hard because I have, I have the, like, the image, the picture of it in my head, but I can't really, I can't really articulate um, in English. So think about this, you have a virus and you have a cell membrane. The virus gets to the membrane, membrane surrounds it, and then it starts to go up and pops, and the membrane 
um, is not interrupted behind it. Like, you know, like you make, a, what you might call it, uh, the soap bubbles. You make a bubble, and then when it, when it is formed, sometimes you have that little tiny film of the soap behind the bubble intact. If you make it slow enough, it will remain intact. Does that make sense? What I'm trying to say. Same happens with the virus. Actually, let me do one thing. Uh, for the sake of demonstration, we're gonna try this. Um, this is the pretty cool video produced not by this probably Indian dude but by uh, Harvard Hughes Medical Institute. So you can see uh, the particle. Wait a minute. So let me. So this is the, the, the virus. Okay, I'm going to pause it. Oh, God. Okay. So these are the protein, proteins that comprise the envelope. This is dengue virus. To give an idea, this is the enveloped virus. So we have envelope capsid that has positive strand RNA genome. One strand of RNA that can be used for translation. Okay. Envelope proteins and the lipid bilayer. What I want you to kind of notice is that enveloped proteins are very precisely arranged. You see that? They're very, very um, repetitive pattern of arrangement okay so this is capsid okay and inside of the capsid is the RNA gene so the virus gets to the cell and attaches to the cellular surface it attaches to the receptors. Um, as far as I remember, for dengue virus, the com dengue virus uh, can interact with multiple receptors. One of them is so-called FC receptor, okay, receptor for um, FC fragment of antibody. Other receptors, the cognate receptors, different. Uh, carbohydrates on the surface of the cell. So it attaches to the receptor. No, no sparkles. No sparkles. And it triggers the endocytosis. You see? The virus gets endocytosed. So this is the endosome. This is, this is the endosome. The, the virus is inside the endosome. And eventually, endosome becomes acidified. Look at the structure of the envelope proteins. You see how it changes? You see? So that change, structural change envelope proteins, is because of dropping pH in the endosome. So they rearrange and they promote fusion. Now look at this process. This is called fusion. When you have virus surrounded by the membrane mixed with the proteins, virus membranes, membrane fuses with the, like in this example, endosomal membrane. Does that make sense? It actually, one of, so it's wonderful that you can see it. It's, it's a great illustration of what's going on. And the virus is released from the capsid is released from the cell. Capsid quickly disassembles, releasing the RNA. Um, can you still see it? I, maybe a little bit too dark there. I cannot do anything about it. If you want, you can turn off the lights for for a minute. Uh, you, the bottom, the bottom one. Yeah. Okay. So now you can see here. Before we sh we see RNA, it's a nucleus. The purple one. And next to it is going to be rough endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, with a bunch of ribosomes. Remember, rough endoplasmic reticulum is the membranous structure. So let's see what's going on there. That's the viral RNA. 
It binds with the ribosome. And it's being translated. This blue surface is the membrane. The viral protein, this huge protein, the viral genome is about 11,000 nucleotides. The viral protein, the polyprotein, is bound to the membrane. So that's the protein. What's going to happen to it now? It's going to get cut in pieces. This tiny brown thing that goes around is the protease, the enzyme, that cuts the, the protein, okay? It comes from the host cell, not from the virus. And you can see, so there's a the envelope protein, and there was capsid protein right there. And there's going to be another protease. That's the virus protease. So it's going to participate in cutting as well. So eventually, all virus proteins are separated one from another. Does that make sense? And then, uh, some of them will assemble in the replication complex. Now, human cell, or for that matter, any eukaryotic cell, can it copy RNA into RNA. Hmm? Is there a mechanism in the eukaryotic cell to copy RNA molecule into another RNA molecule? It's a simple question. Did we ever mention that? No. There is no such mechanism. Only DNA can be copied. You can replicate DNA, you can transcribe DNA, but RNA, you can't do anything about it. Does that make sense? That is why replication complex for this particular virus comes from the virus. So the replication complex binds with the virus RNA, green positive strand, and it starts to produce red negative strand. Essentially, you have a double-stranded RNA for some time. Okay? Now, this double-stranded RNA is used as a matrix for genome synthesis. New copies of green positive RNA strand are produced. So yeah, it's going to go, we're going to show you for quite some time. It's really wonderful animation here. And it gives you sort of a bigger picture. So all those, all those green molecules, a positive strand um, RNAs, and they used to produce a bunch of viral proteins. Now, these are envelope proteins. These are capsid proteins. So capsid proteins interact with the RNA and assemble into the nucleocapsid. Nucleocapsid is then enveloped by the virus proteins. And when virus, you see it's not, the envelope is not yet arranged in the proper way. It goes through the Golgi complex and matures. Okay. It is processed in the Golgi complex in vesicle and is released from the cell and then it goes to infect others. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you those intimate details of, of the dengue virus replication cycle. I just showed you this video to give you a perspective of the stages, how it happens. Different viruses they do it slightly differently, but I hope you got the idea. I really do. Okay, if you want to turn on the lights and nobody falls asleep, that would be lovely. Now,
how can you okay this old knowledge knowledge about the replication cycle sounds very fundamental cool but fundamental what is the so imagine there's 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 some there's some group that studies the process of uncoding of a particular virus I hate to say this actually I don't think we ever should pop this question like why science is useful but how it can be applied what is what can be an application of studying and encoding or biosynthesis or release process fantastic we can do it yes yes we can we can knowing how virus replicates all intricate details of the virus replication we can tweak it to use as the therapy tool the viral oncotherapy for instance what else can we use this information in treatment of the virus diseases yeah if we know how something works we know how to break it well hopefully and it turns out if we inhibit if we can inhibit a step in the replication cycle we can create an antiviral and we're gonna we're gonna see the examples of it Does that makes sense now bed bugs we're not gonna talk about a huge number of viruses human viruses I selected some of them there is no particular agenda why I selected this and not, not others. So the first one, and let's, let's make a conversation out of it, HIV, human immune deficiency virus. So this is the retrovirus, okay? Which means it has a step in its replication cycle that goes backwards. Let's quickly review the replication cycle of HIV. The virus binds to the surface of the cells and its receptor is CD4. There's you know, a few beads here. The core receptor, additional molecule that is also required for the virus attachment, is CCR5. In some instances, is a different. Okay, don't memorize it, but focus on this. HIV needs two molecules for attachment, CD4 and CCR5. Afterwards, the viral envelope fuses with the cytoplasmic membrane. Okay? You, you've already seen fusion. It should sound familiar to you. The capsid enters the cytoplasm and disassembles in the cytoplasm. And you can see the viral RNA okay, in the cell. Now the viral RNA is bound to the enzyme that is called reverse transcriptase. Based on the name, what does it do? But it's reverse transcriptase, so it's the transcription, but going which, which way? Backwards. So what is the normal transcription? I don't know what transcription is. Explain me. What is the normal transcription? What is converted into what? Transcription. DNA to mRNA. That's transcription. What's the reverse then? RNA into DNA. Single-stranded RNA is converted into the double-stranded DNA. Does that make sense? Let's write it down. That's the reverse transcription. Okay. The enzyme, often referred to as RT, reverse transcriptase, okay, controls it. Now you have double-stranded DNA, 
And then next enzyme that is called integrase inserts the viral DNA, well, double-stranded DNA, into the genome of the CD4 cell. Does it make sense what I just said? It's like phage, sort of. Okay? Gets in the genome. And it sits there. It may sit there for years. One day, upon stress, immune depletion, this DNA is transcribed, normally transcribed. So what is produced? Exactly. Not just RNA. It's the RNA that matches that initial viral RNA. Does that make sense? So we're kind of going, at some point, this process goes backwards. You see up top what I, what I write? So double-stranded DNA becomes single-stranded RNA. Now, this RNA is the typical mRNA. It's positive. RNA used for the protein synthesis. Proteins assemble into the capsid. Package RNA. So you have capsid, you have envelope, you have mature virions. Does that make sense? You have to appreciate that between this moment and this moment, in some cases, are years. Okay, does that make sense so far? Now, this double stranded DNA, the viral DNA, it is called provirus. Does it go anywhere? Ever? No. Again, think about this. The person is infected with HIV. HIV is for life. There's no way. Well, we don't know any way to cut the DNA out. Because think again. You have to get it out of all CD4 cells. All of them, including the ones in the bone marrow. And by virtue of the number of CD4 cells, it's not possible. Let's admit it. Okay? Um, so, other retroviruses, there are many of retroviruses. They use the same mechanism. They may not necessarily infect CD4 cells. It can be other cells. But interesting thing is that I'm going to steer away a little bit from HIV and we will come back to it. Retroviruses, when the double-stranded DNA is incorporated into the human chromosome, if they sit there for a long time and not are not reactivated, not, you know, just sit there latent, they may essentially become dysfunctional in terms of the virus production. And such retroviral genomes that are dysfunctional, that are sitting in the human chromosome, not obviously doing anything, are called endogenous retroviruses. Why focus your attention on this? About 10% of human genome is composed of endogenous retroviruses. They are important, unbelievably important element in the human evolution. A couple of examples. Well, some one example is kind of vague. Uh, the regulatory element that controls production of interferon comes from endogenous retroviruses. But something more profound is human placenta. As you know, placenta not only separates the blood flow of the mother and the fetus, it is also very effective in preventing pathogens from getting from the mother's blood to the fetal blood. There are some exceptions, but overall, if mother is sick, fetus will be decently protected by the placenta. Does that make sense? There are cells 
responsible for that barrier. They are called trophoblasts. The protein that <laughs> let's say provides that protection pretty much sticks the trophoblasts together, forms that wall. It's called syncytin. The entire syncytin gene is coming from endogenous retrovirus. So it's some they so essentially retroviruses made our placenta what it is now. And it's if you think about this, that's pretty cool, really. Okay. So coming back to HIV. Let's talk about first step, the attachment. Two receptors, CD4 and CCR5. We're going to find CD4 receptor. Which cells of the immune system? Mm -hmm. You find them at T cells. CCR4, CCR5 molecules are there too. Um, based on what we learned so far about immunology, can you imagine a person without CD4? Healthy person, healthy. No, really, I mean, if you have T cells, you have CD4 in them, right? Like helper population, you have CD4. Turns out, not everyone has a functional CCR5. The story of the discovery is interesting. Well, first of all, when humans got HIV, You don't have to know that. I mean, I'm, I'm taking guesses. That's that's we, when we we found it. When did when when did the virus appear? Uh, we know we know we, we know place. Cameroon, 1920s. We were able to trace it genetically trace it back. Cameroon, 1920s. Some hunter was probably skinning a monkey, probably gorilla, probably not necessarily gorilla. Monkeys have a similar virus. It's called simian immunodeficiency virus, and it just jumped into the poor fella. And poor fella developed HIV, probably died from it. Although you can imagine in Africa, it's a garden variety of causes of, of death. You know, you can pick whatever you want. Um, so, and then in 1955, I think, there was a huge vaccination program in um, Congo which either I don't remember if it was the Belgian colony at the time or was not just just you know taking independence but there was few few uh, Belgian doctors and they had no bad intentions whatsoever they were doing vaccination and some malaria treatment programs you know they dedicated days, months, years of their life protecting locals. They did injectable treatments. And in 1955 there were no disposable syringes and they had absolutely no... and we're talking about tens of thousands of people treated. I don't remember what they were treating it for. They had absolutely no way to autoclave syringes. That is considered to be a single major cause of initial HIV spread in Africa. So instead of localized population, you know, few hundred cases, we now have quarter of continent carrying it. And people from Africa, they moved to South America, to Caribbean, mostly to Haiti, okay? you know, looking for the better life. And then one day, um, a flight attendant from Canada came to Haiti, had an intercourse, acquired HIV, flew back to Canada, then came to New York. His lover was in New York, so they had intercourse. And there you go, you got HIV in New York. It was first place, 1981, when it popped up. And people started to die. Initially, it was called, I think, gay immunodeficiency syndrome, or guess, gay associated immunodeficiency syndrome, because the gay community was 
most uh, affected. And then, you know, it started to spread by the United States. And, you know, another prolific uh, gay community was in San Francisco, so that was second place for the disease to start spreading. And it was pretty scary. Really scary. I remember 1988, it sounded like we're all going to die. No, seriously, they, the mass media were, you know, promoting that idea that it's a new plague. And people were dying. <laughs> it's not funny, but people were dying and nobody knew what to do. Uh, a couple of years later, I think it was 1983, the virus was actually isolated. Luke Lintonier, Frank Gallo, and um, another lady, uh, they isolated the virus. They showed that it is a, so eventually they pinned it down as a cause of infection cause of disease, cause of AIDS. Nobody could treat it, so it was a death sentence, essentially. And there was one person that didn't die from it. He was uh, deeply disturbed by this fact. His friends, his lovers, were dying from HIV, from AIDS, around him. People he had sex with were dying from it. And we knew at this point, and he knew that the disease is transmitted by sexual routes, but he had no idea why he's still alive. So in 1988, he came to um, one of the hospitals in New York. I don't want to give you false information. It was one of the big medical centers. And he described the situation. He said, for some reason, I just don't get sick. Doctors and scientists started to look what's going on, and they first what they did, they looked at the receptors in his CD4 cells. At this time, we knew that virus infected CD4 cells. Turned out, a gentleman had a mutation in his CCR5 gene. It's, it was a deletion. The fragment of the gene was gone. And essentially, that made CCR5, this molecule, unfit for virus attachment his CD4 cells simply did not get infected. It was, of course, a glimpse of hope. Then it turned out it's not that simple. Um, interestingly enough, CCR5 deletion uh, doesn't have any other phenotype. So people who sometimes they, they just name CCR5 negative or they have a, a mutation, okay? People with this mutation have no associated abnormalities. Does that make sense? So it looks like it doesn't, doesn't have any observable phenotype. Who has it? Estimations of the prevalence for this mutation different uh, from 0.1 one, from to 0.5 percent in the uh, Caucasian population. More are observed in North Europeans, so we talk Dutch, Sweden, Finland, and whatnot. Uh, it, pract it is practically absent in um, people of African descent or Asian descent. Okay. Can it be used as the therapeutic approach? What do you think? Realistically. kicking out, it's really hard to kick out the gene or to get this mutation introduced. It's, it's incredibly hard. All our attempts at gene therapy of any sorts are futile. <laughs> we really, we suck at gene therapy. <laughs> Just awful. It, it's depressing. Um, there was, though, a case two or three years ago, German patient with HIV had leukemia, and he had a, a bone marrow transplant. But it wasn't just bone marrow transplant. The transplant was taken from a person who had CCR5 mutation. So first they destroyed bone marrow, and then they introduced that new bone marrow with CD4 cells that are 
CCR5 incompetent, and for month and month after the transplantation, the patient did not have detectable HIV levels because virus does not have anything to infect anymore. Even if it was lurking someplace else, the cells it replicates in are not susceptible. Does that make sense? That's, I think it's a pretty cool story. It doesn't confer protection against all HIV subtypes. There are two. One, it, well, but type 1, it, it protects against type 1, which is most common. So what happens um, after the DNA, that, that pro-virus, gets unsilenced? New viruses, get, rep they reproduce. They reproduce in CD4 cells. They leave CD4 cells. What happens to CD4 cells? The virus replicates in the cell, gets out of the cell. What happens to the cell? Eventually. It dies. Yeah, it dies. They die. CD4 cells die. And there's a huge drop in numbers. What do CD4 cells do? Macrophages, B cells, CD8 cells, right? So you all immune, the entire immunity just goes in the dumpster, the whole thing. Patients with HIV that don't die of HIV, they die of secondary infections. And what is benign in or mild in healthy person becomes devastating in those people, in, in patients with AIDS. Um, herpes. In us, in immunocompetent people, it's common cold. In AIDS patients, Keratitis, hepatitis, pneumonia. CMV. We don't even know if we have it. Pneumonia and hepatitis. Cryptosporidium parvum. A tiny little protozoa that causes diarrhea. Pre can be found in drinking water because uh, it's really hard to get rid of it. You cannot possibly boil old water that old tap water. So, for instance, in New York, cryptosporidium parvum can be found in every, you know, I don't know, every thousand tons or something like that. So there is a chance, and there were cases of crypto being, when HIV patients in New York, AIDS patients in New York acquired crypto, they don't have immunity, and we don't have really good drugs. So the person gets diarrhea for the rest of their lives. So it, it's really, it's really awful, really, those secondary infections. Okay. And the symptoms of um, the initial infections, like fatigue and night sweats, very unspecific. Secondary person gets wasted. If you, one of the great examples, you can actually watch it. Even if you're not a huge fan of Freddie Mercury, look at him on the videos from 1987, 1988, the time of albums like, like Miracle. He looks fine. But if you look at him in the video clips, like I'm going, especially I'm going slightly mad. It's two months before he died. Uh, I read the accounts of his friends. They said he was like a walking dad. They had to put half an inch of, of makeup on him to mask how horrible he looked. And even with that makeup on the, in the video, you can see he looks scary. He looks creepy because he's, he's, he's done. Okay, that's really, and, and they, they didn't, they weren't afraid to make, to do a, a like a, a blow up plan, you know up close, show him up close, you can see it's it's really a sad picture. So of course, having this infection spreading through, by the way, how does it spread through the population? What are the transmission routes? Blood, sexual. Blood, who are at risk? Hmm? Not so much. I mean, you, you can't really know. No, the other cohort, really big risk. People who use what? 
drugs, injectable drugs. How can you fight it? Can you stop people from using drugs? No. Huh? Get them, bingo, get them syringes. Is there a proof? Unfortunately, there is. My loving home country, there were some fucking morons that decided that if they stop giving syringes to people who use injectable drugs, they will stop using injectable drugs. Guess what? We now have epidemic of HIV in several cities. It's, it's like a sort of a Russian rust belt, so depressive regions. And there, there's an epidemic of drug use, okay. That's separate issue. People don't stop using drugs. They just start to sharing, to share syringes, and it's it's scary. It is really scary, and the problem is that those morons are in power. They really like it makes me absolutely mad. Okay, so here's your experiment. Okay, so in the United States, transmission via syringe use is very low. There was a problem with transfusion. Now every batch of the blood is tested for HIV. There is no transfusion associated transmission in the US anymore. Okay? So we got the blood transfusion. Something else. Another one. Well, vertical. There's no vertical trans uh, in the US, vertical transmission is practically eliminated because we have therapy, we'll discuss it. Um, sexual. Initially it was male-to-male uh, -male sex. Because of the traumatic nature of the intercourse, um, the mucous membranes were exposed to the potential infected blood or blood was exposed to the potential infected um, mucous membranes. Okay, and uh, some people considered it to be sort of a godsend punishment to gay people, which I find absolutely appalling. Um, and I think those people were pretty, pretty well discredited because uh, the population, general population, considered it, oh, I'm not gay, I'm fine. Guess what? Transmission of HIV among gay population is now going down. Transmission of HIV in heterosexual population goes up. My personal take on this, uh, and my gay friends told me about this, not necessarily in relation to HIV, they became much more aware of it. And the, practic, practic, the practice of safe sex is now a big point in gay community. However, in heterosexual, oh, I'm heterosexual, I'm not going to acquire it. The chances actually to get infected during the sexual intercourse is about 1%. So if non-infected person has sex with infected person, there's 1% chance that there's going to be transmission. But repetitive takes on that, you know, you have higher chances to get this. So during the uh, vaginal intercourse, the transmission is between mucous membranes. Okay, vaginal mucosa and penile mucosa. Pressing questions. Can one acquire HIV by oral sex? There were cases recorded. It is unbelievably rare. Pretty much the virus cannot enter through the oral mucosa. It can enter through the wounds in the mouth. If there are any, then yes. And it is not shed in the saliva, so the person with HIV doesn't shed any virus in the saliva. Same goes for kissing. Can you acquire, well, if you bite each other, then yes, there is a chance. Other than that, no. Does that make sense? So, we now know how it is transmitted. How do we treat it? Just one second. Let me erase all of it. You are 
a scientist, how would you approach the development of treatment? Don't look there. Look at the picture. How would you approach the development of treatment? Yes. Bingo. You kind of summarize the entire approach. Try to interrupt any one of those steps. Find inhibitors that would break down the cycle. Some steps <clears throat> are easier to interrupt than others. The first drug that was discovered was azithromycin AZT and it interrupted the reverse transcriptase. It was the so-called nucleoside analog. Okay? Which means it looks like a nucleoside and it is incorporated in the growing chain of DNA and it stops it there. So when it is incorporated, nothing else can be inserted, DNA is incompetent, nothing happens. Okay. Well, do you think doctors were happy? Yeah. Patients were happy. Everybody were happy. Okay. They started to use it. It worked wonderful. Decreased the virus titers. CD4 titers went up. Everybody was happy. What happened next? Yeah. And what essentially happened? Absolutely resistant virus. This is the enormously mutating virus. So AZT, and that was quite a wake-up call for doctors. So they started to develop new, well, not doctors, but scientists started to develop new therapies that were targeted. Now we have approved therapies that target attachment infusion, a shitload of drugs that target reverse transcriptase. Recently, a couple of drugs were approved that target integrase. And we have several drugs that target they don't specifically target the assembly, but virus proteins, those little tiny dots you can see on the bottom, they have to get processed in the cell. So virus protease kind of modifies them. So we have drugs that inhibit virus protease, essentially preventing the formation of competent virus particles. We probably have as, ma as many HIV, anti-HIV drugs as we have for all other viruses taken together. Maybe more. Okay. Um, now, those therapeutic approaches are generally, well, kind of together called HART, highly active anti-retroviral therapy. If you would look at any heart protocol, <clears throat> they usually have two, three drugs in a combination. Why? Oh, they all work. They all work perfectly. It you kind of on the right track. It's not about not working, but you just mentioned what virus does when it is exposed to the drug. Yes, but if you if the virus is exposed to three different drugs, chances it will develop resistance to all three are second to none. Does that make sense? Right? Like you're playing dodgeball, if one person throws the ball at you, you can you can dodge it. If three, good luck with that. Okay, if three are my kids, then you can you can dodge five. Um, now, another thing, protocols change. So you take a certain set of drugs over several years, then doctor will change it to a new set of drugs. So that keeps virus susceptible to those drugs. Does that make sense? It, it's, it's not exposed long enough to become resistant. With highly active antiretroviral therapy, WHO now considers HIV a chronic 
disease. It is not, so it means that people who are properly treated will maintain the normal lifespan. And I always tell, you know, look at Magic Johnson. This guy look, he's going to look the same when I'm going to be old and wrinkly. Okay, he's going to play basketball when I'm going to be in the grave. Right? That's, he's on, on the therapy, it works. Um, like with antibiotics, there are, Patients should be compliant, absolutely 100% compliant, not missing the pills, not stopping the therapy because now I feel great. Okay, it's all a doctor's decision, right? Uh, there was a move recently to, I don't remember if we discussed it, there was a move to, uh, if the person is HIV positive, they must notify their sexual partner that they're HIV positive. There's a move to stop this practice if virus is not detected in the blood. Because there was there was a there was a study showing if virus is not detected in the blood anymore, then person doesn't transmit the virus. It's it's like it's established fact. So they were saying, okay, if you have no virus, detectable virus in the blood, you do not have to notify partner. What's your take on that? Do you think it's a good idea or do you think it's not? Mm -hmm. I'm totally I'm totally with this because I don't trust people. And if somebody takes the drugs religiously and doesn't have a virus, I cannot guarantee that this person will continue doing that. So I understand it's a social stigma, but unfortunately, okay, that's what people have to live with. Does that make sense? And actually, if you fail to notify, I think it's a felony. Okay, there was a, there was a case when the person was put to trial for manslaughter because the guy transmitted it. He was he knew that he was HIV positive. He had sex with multiple women and transmitted HIV to those multiple women, and they developed. Uh, it's, it wasn't like men's slaughter, but it was like attempted men's slaughter, something like that. And scientists actually managed to demonstrate that the HIV that this guy had matched the HIV that those women had, because his defense was built on how do you know that it's you know his HIV. And they traced it down and it showed it's the same HIV and he was, uh, uh, he got the jail time. Um, there's no vaccine. I mentioned that. Um, there were multiple tries. The problem with HIV vaccine, okay, before we talk about the problem with HIV vaccine, What does the vaccine do? Any vaccine. What's the purpose? Immunity. And so so you do not get what? Sick. Sick. Ideally, of course, you do not get infected. Now, in some cases, you have a vaccine, like hypothetical vaccine, you have memory cells and all of that. You get the infection, but your immune system shuts it down. You still have some replication, right? But your immune system clears it fast. You don't have any symptoms. With HIV, if you have an infection, what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of, can you clear it? No. You're done. Even if it replicates at a tiny little level, it gets in the CD4 cells. Does that make sense? So vaccine, ideally, have to provide the immunity that will shut down the virus, just destroy it, prevent it from infecting. As far as we know, it's impossible. So ideally, HIV vaccine should work post-exposure. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? It should work with people who are already infected to control HIV. 
Um, well, I wouldn't be that pessimistic that it's not possible. We just don't know how to do that. Okay. There were multiple trials. They tried antibodies. They tried inactivated vaccines, subunit vaccine. There was a study when they tried adenovirus vector vaccine. It sucked because the HIV rates in people who received vaccine versus placebo were actually higher. Like they, they had to just stop the trial. Um, now they, I didn't, didn't uh, look closely last time, but a couple of years ago there was a big buzz. I told you the uh, vaccine based on CMV against the HIV vaccine, um, which worked nice in monkeys. Maybe we're in the way. Um, now, before we go to the break, kind of a, a summary. Basic steps of the replication cycle. So understand what reverse transcriptase does, what integrase does. What are the challenges in terms of incorporation into the CD4 cell? Clear? Receptors. The idea, CCR5 is mutated, there's no entry, no attachment, no entry. Does that make sense? Um, idea of secondary infections, just, just, and the whole concept of virus being latent, hiding as a provirus in the DNA, and then reactivating years later, right? And causing CD4 titers to drop, affecting the entire immunity, making persons susceptible to secondary infections. Um, heart, highly active antiretroviral therapy. Know what drugs are targeting. Again, you, you, you will not have to provide the list. But if I tell you what the drugs cannot target, for instance, uncoding, they, they cannot target uncoding. Does that make sense? Uh, and what is the challenge with the vaccine? That idea that it has to completely prevent replication, which is not really possible. Okay, let's take a break.